Hey, it's Mr. Johns, and this is the Unit 2 presentation. We are going to talk about signs, signals, and roadway markings. And uh, there are three types of signs that you'll see on the road. First is regulatory. Regulatory. So they are um, signs that will display regulations, which means laws. So they're the they're legal, um, legal signs. And the second one is warning signs. Typically, they are a diamond-shaped yellow sign um, set up to warn you of something that's coming ahead. And the third kind is um, guide signs. So, and these are these are uh, airport, uh, like this one shows, or national park ahead, things like that. So they'll help guide you um, around. So regulatory signs, like I said, they reinforce laws. Warning signs indicate some kind of hazard ahead. Guide signs provide help getting to a destination. Um, you will need to memorize, learn the shapes and colors and meanings of signs um, so you can uh, both pass my tests and the state test, but also so you know um, what they are when you see them on the road. Um, they, they do this so that if you're, if you're driving at night and you can't see what's on the sign, may, may, maybe not even see the color of the sign because of the weather conditions um, or, or the sun, sun conditions, lighting conditions, um, each of the signs has a special shape. So just by looking at it, um, you should know like, oh, that's a speed sign or, oh, that means no passing, so I can't pass here. So, and that's why they do it that way. Um, and colors have meaning, so red is such an important thing. They put it on the stop sign. Um, they get blue, black, orange. Orange is construction zones. Green, yellow, warning signs. White, which you'll see on the back of uh, speed limit signs. And then brown, you'll see those on uh, typically uh, national parks, um, guide signs that give you information about um, um, things like um, um, parks and, um, and uh, visitor sites. So make sure you can identify the signs by their shape and color just by looking at them. Um, in this graphic, the silver car at the bottom has a yield sign. So he must wait until there are no cars in the closest lane to him. Uh, he then must also turn right. So there's a lot going on, even though there's just a few signs in this graphic. Um, so we know that it's a one-way street to the right because of the one-way sign that we see there. Um, right here, I see that. Uh, and the yield sign is bright red and white and a special shape. It's an upside-down triangle. So you know that you cannot just go. Yield means give them the right of way. So over here on the other side of the street, behind the other cars, you can see uh, a do not enter sign. So, and I can't read the words from here. Um, but because of the shape and the color and the symbol on it, um, I know exactly what it is. And so there's a great example of why they do that. So it's a red circle with a white uh, kind of dash across it, which means uh, do not enter. Uh, so yield to U-turns. This, this I added just recently because it's been such an issue here in Boise Meridian area. Um, more uh, intersections are allowing cars to flip around and do a U-turn when their light turns green. And typically this would be a, a left turn only lane, but now they can do a UE. Um, and um, you know how we always say, go to the closest lane to you? In this case, like this graphic, this little blue car looks like a Mini Cooper, uh, maybe. Um, it couldn't turn sharp enough to go to the closest lane. Um, to it. So it will end up in the second lane over, which if you're that red car, typically you could go um, because you're stopped at a red light. And if it's clear, you could go. Now you have to yield to these U-turns. And there's a few intersections uh, around Boise Meridian now that say um, there's a special light that turns on that says um, you can't go. So you have to wait until these people do their U-turn and then it's your turn. So just be aware of there's something else to watch out for. Railroad crossings are so dangerous that they have several unique signs. Um, their warning sign is round. So it's, uh, it's the only round sign you'll see. I think other than that, do not um, enter sign. 
Um, but this one's yellow and black, and it has RR uh, Railroad Crossing. So this will basically be back a ways and tell you, hey, coming up is a railroad crossing. And then the, war the actual warning sign, the diamond-shaped sign there, will be closer to the tracks, um, pretty close to the tracks. The crossbuck sign, which is the big X, it's white and black, that is found right at the tracks. So just remember the weird name, it's called a cross buck. Don't know why, that's what it's called. Um, and um, you also need to be aware that sometimes there's more than one track. And so on this last graphic over here, uh, it has a railroad crossing um, cross buck sign plus flashing lights plus a little sign that says there are two tracks. So what can happen is a train goes by and as soon as it's um, past you, you might just go. Well, if there's two tracks, there could be another train coming in the opposite direction that you didn't see. So have to be aware of that. Construction zones, lots of orange, lots of orange. So it means slow down and expect the unexpected. Construction zones change like hour by hour. So it is just um, a case of needing to slow down, read the signs, watch what's going on around you. There be, might be some cones, there might be some uh, heavy equipment working, there might be some um, construction workers with signs um, guiding you uh, where, where you where you can drive and if you need to stop or go. So just pay extra attention. Left turns, um, like I was talking about, left turn only lane. Um, this is a great example, these three lights here. This would be two lights that go straight and one light that goes left. Um, if it is a green arrow, please remember this. If it's a green arrow, you have the right of way. That is called a protected turn, all right? So typically a, a left turn uh, light will give you, let's say 20 seconds of protected turning. So you can just go. Now you should always yield and, and, and pay attention obviously, but you have the right of way legally. So um, once that, arrow turns to a green circle, like on this sign here. Um, and this sign even tells you left turn yield on green. But there seems to be crashes that happen. People just see green, they think they can go. That because we teach green means go. Uh, but green might mean yield. So in a turn lane, green arrow means protected, you're protected, you can just go. A green circle means yield. If there's any oncoming traffic, let them go first. All right, pavement markings. Um, there's also things on the road you need to pay attention to. Um, and um, they have their own colors and designs and patterns and things like that. They're fairly self-explanatory. This graphic will show you, hey, here's a lane where you can only go straight. There's a lane where you can only go right and a lane where you can only go left. It looks like on the other side of the road, there's a, a double solid yellow line, which means you can't pass and they can't pass. And it looks like there's two lanes of traffic on the other side. So um, something to learn and watch out for as you're, as you're driving. And when you're in the back of the driver's ed car and you've got nothing else to do, that's a good thing to look for. Just see if you know what all those uh, pavement markings mean. So the broken lines in the middle of the road uh, mean, you, mean um, that you can pass. Um, and if, it's, if they're white dashed lines, that will typically mean it's a one-way street. Now if they're yellow dashed lines, is typically a two-way road, cars going both directions. So if you have a broken line on your side, you can pass. So in this case, if there was a car over here on the right side of the road, um, that car could go around another car, speed up and get back in their lane. Now it looks like it's kind of on a corner, so probably not a good idea here, but that dashed line means the right side can pass, left side can not pass. Double solid always means no passing for either side. All right, so here's a typical city street. Um, you should know what this means. There's two lanes going both directions. There is a center or shared turn lane. Um, and by shared, in this case, yeah, shared. Cars could be um, turning left or right, facing each other and moving towards each other at the same time. So it takes some cooperation. Um, this symbol, not so common um, in smaller areas, maybe in big cities. I think Boise maybe has a few lanes like this. Um, it means HOV or high occupant vehicle lanes. Um, so in bigger cities, they'll have a, a, a lane at the far left, typically on a freeway, where you can, can only be in that lane if you have a, uh, a passenger or two. It has to be more than one, not just the driver. 
So, uh, this is kind of a goofy name, I thought, but they call this a Shero. It's a bike lane, um, often in the middle of the road that you must be aware of, or off kind of to the side. It's not a bike lane, but it means um, shared. So, um, they call it a Shero. You'll, there could be cars or bikes in that lane. I haven't, I haven't seen, I don't think, any of those yet, but um, they'll be coming as, as, um, as they continue to improve the bike um, lane situation around Idaho. So a stop line, this is this white, this wide white line right here. It marks where a vehicle must stop, have to. Now, if there is no line, the law says you have to stop before you enter traffic. And so that would be, let's say, an imaginary line between these um, sidewalks, between these curbs here. So your car could go all the way out. So yeah, it's a little bit further actually, but you could go all the way out to here and stop here um, as long as you're not blocking traffic. But if there is a stop line, you must stop there. Oh, let me go back to that because it's kind of a trick question. You might see this on one of my quizzes, by the way. Um, the question might read um, like, um, the law says you must stop exactly at a stop sign. Um, the answer is false. Uh, so a stop sign just means you have to stop at this intersection. So it doesn't even matter where the stop sign is. It can be 20 feet back. It could be right on the corner. doesn't matter. It just is there to tell you at this intersection you must stop. Okay. So the difference is stop sign, you have to stop somewhere. The stop line, you have to stop before that stop line. Not on it, not over it, before it. And if there's none of those, just somewhere before your car um, crosses into the into the lane of traffic all right so a lot of things going on here pedestrian crosswalks i chose this graphic because it uh, shows all kinds of different pedestrian um, um, crosswalks that can be at intersections um, like on the far left here there can be a crosswalk right in the middle of a block um, right there um, and and that's called a mid -blo mid block crosswalk and the one on the far right is an unmarked crosswalk so pedestrians have the right of way in marked or unmarked it's true if there's no crosswalk they still have the right of way our job is to protect the pedestrians all right let's talk about time and space management a little bit constantly scan for hazards in the vol in the following three visual search areas all that means is when you're driving you should constantly be looking in these three um, areas and th the first one is your peripheral vision that's off to the sides and you're, you, you have good enough peripheral vision that you can kind of see that without even turning left and right. It's kind of what you um, might see some movement. You might see a child running. You might see a car move. But um, kind of just be aware of what's off to the sides. Central vision, which is um, what you're looking at mostly. It's kind of like um, the street, the sidewalks, and maybe the storefronts as you drive down Main Street. Right, so that's your central vision. And then your focus vision is middle of the road, it's where you're going, it's where you're headed. Um, and so all three of those areas you need to be in control of and be aware of. So uh, this is kind of what I've already said, uh, except for with a, a Homer Simpson there. Um, focus vision, it's where you're gonna aim your car. Central vision, you see the whole street. Peripheral vision, off to the sides. That's exactly what I just said. Uh, IPDE. So, uh, sure, we need to have some acronyms in driver's ed, and one of them is IPDE, Identify, Predict, Decide, Execute. Uh, your in-car instructor might do it differently, uh, might have a different term, but this is pretty common. Um, um, so it just means as you're driving, and it's not like you have to be, you know, shouting out, I, I identify a child playing in the street. It's just something you do naturally, automatically as you're driving. You're going to identify the child playing near the street. and the, um, You're predicting that he has a ball in his hand and he's kind of kicking it. Um, doesn't look like he's a, a soccer a star, so um, this ball could go in any direction any minute. So you're predicting, okay, identify, predict. And then you decide, I'm going to cover my brake, which means I'm just going to put my foot um, near, over, not on, but over the brake just in case. And then E, execute the ball. Sure enough, bounces right in front of you. The child turns and runs after it because it's his precious soccer ball. And because you were um, paying attention, you execute your idea of stopping, 
putting on the brake and uh, saving the child's life. So good job. So I P D E. So managing the space to the ear to the rear, you should always be checking um, your rear view mirror. So I'm I'm more worried about things behind me. It, now these days, if someone is texting and they're just going 60 miles an hour and the light turns red, I've noticed it. I've stopped, but they're still going 60 miles an hour. I'm done. So I'm checking my rear view mirrors uh, before and while I'm braking. I check it when I'm stopped, um, making sure the cars behind me are stopping. Um, and I check it before and after making turns or a lane change. So check, check that rear view mirror on a regular basis. So while driving, identify vehicle types because big heavy trucks take longer to slow down. So when I look in my rear view mirror and I'm stopped and I see a semi truck coming at me at 40, 50 miles an hour and he's not slowing down, I'm getting nervous. And so I can do a lane change and get out of the way if I need to, or I can tap my brakes to let him know, hey, I'm stopped. Um, so it, it, it does matter what kind of vehicles you see, motorcycle, convertible, sports car, uh, whatever it is, big truck, uh, sand truck full of sand. Um, it kind of affects the way um, traffic is moving and, and the way that you need to react. So identify non-motorized users also. And so that's all the people, all the pedestrians. And it seems like there's a lot out there to pay attention to. And you're right. And that's why you can't be texting, distracted, eating, talking to a carload of friends and, and doing everything except for driving. Um, there's so much to pay attention to. And, and this is just one category. So skateboarders, runners, joggers, bicyclists, etc. cetera. So um, what's around this corner? Looks like a great drive, beautiful day. I could be on a Harley or driving the, my Mustang with the top down and love it. And uh, boom, right around the corner. Um, this and um, looks like the weather changed a little bit too uh, but um, what that means is line of sight I can't see around the corner so don't be going 65 miles an hour um, just driving free thinking no big deal um, because something could have just happened around that corner and that kind of goes back to IPDE so I identify that I can't see around the corner I predict that there could be something, um, it could be an animal on the road. And so I'm going to slow down. I'm going to slide over to the outside of the lane a little bit and, um, and it could save your life. So a line of sight on a hill is kind of similar. So this, this picture kind of shows that I'm going up a hill and around a corner. Um, I can't see what's around there. Someone could have a flat tire. There could be an animal on the road. Uh, a rock could have fallen off. Uh, see, that's what driving is like. I mean, it's it's a constant, should be a constant um, effort of IPDE. So that's, I might be weird, but that's how I think as I'm driving. And maybe that's why I, I haven't gotten any wrecks in so many years. Because I'm thinking as I look at this graphic, there, there could be a big rock that has just rolled off um, onto the road. And so I'm going to be watching for that. That's how I think when I'm driving. That's my job when I'm driving. Um, so we call it zone control. Um, it's controlling six areas around your car. So you're the silver car in the middle, and you should be controlling the left front, the front, the right front, left rear, the rear, and the right rear. So there are six zones, and I always kind of refer to it as a bubble. You keep these zones um, under control. Now, by control, it just means you know what's there. You're paying attention. Um, you don't want to be in the middle of a pack of cars. And so there's semi trucks and cars and vehicles all the way around you. That's a little bit nerve wracking. So in this picture, you can see that um, if something happens, uh, one of the cars has a flat tire or swerves because a, a dog runs in the road, you have a couple options, um, places to go in case you need to. And you should always have an out, a place to go in case something happens. So lane positions, you might hear me once in a while talk about uh, move over to lane position three. So if you look at the far left of this picture uh, where it says one right in the middle of the road, that's lane position one. You'll also hear it on cop shows if you watch any uh, shows on TV about policemen or police work. Um, they'll also say I had to move over to lane position three or I, I over to lane position five. So one is in the middle, two is on the left, three is on the right, four is straddling. Um, so it's kind of in the bike lane or even up on the sidewalk sometimes and on the left and five is the exact same thing on the right. Those are the five lane positions. Reference points are kind of a trick, um, a good trick uh, to help know where your car is. 
As a new driver, this is something you'll need to learn. Uh, and your in-car instructor um, may or may not cover this in detail. Um, but this picture is a great example of how I know that if I stop um, where the bottom of my left side mirror is um, lined up with the first line of a crosswalk, um, I am parked, I am stopped in, the, in a safe area. Now, how do I know that? At some point, I probably had to get out and go look, um, honestly. Every car is different. They have longer, longer hoods, bigger bumpers. It's a jacked up truck. It's a low rider car. They're all different. So every car you, you would have to do this with. Uh, and so I assume with this car, we're going to assume with this car that using that reference line, the bottom of the mirror and that line is the perfect place to stop. And so you kind of need to know that for left side, right side, and it will help you know. Uh, in this case, how do I know I'm in the middle of a lane? So um, let's say this is my, I don't know what kind of car this is, but this is my car. I'm driving down the road and um, I know that I'm in the middle and uh, I notice that there's a sticker on the left and there's a little gap, a little bump uh, in the windshield wiper. Um, and as long as I kind of keep those lined up with the, with the lines down the road, um, I'm in the middle of the road. So now again, how do I know that? At some point, um, I either have kind of figured that out just by f the feeling of where I'm at in the road, or I've actually gotten out um, and um, lined these stickers up, these things up, and where there's no traffic stopped, gotten out and looked and said, hey, sure enough, I'm right in the middle of the road. So that's just another example. Now, a lot of times you only need to use reference points if you're having a hard time staying in the middle of the lane. So if you're always hugging the left or always hugging the right, or your, your in-car instructor says, um, we, we need to keep working on lane position because you're all over the place or you're hugging the right side, that's, that's when we would use reference points. So, um, that's exactly what I just said. This slide, like find a road where there's no traffic and you'll be able to basically get out and kind of check things out. So in a parking lot's good too, because you can use um, a parking space. Um, so risk, driving is the riskiest thing that you've ever done, I would assume. Uh, some of you might snowboard or, or skydive and do some risky things, but um, statistically speaking, um, driving um, is the thing that's going to be the, the riskiest for you. Uh, and this is just a quote um, that I like because it talks about um, teens um, having trouble controlling risk, taking impulses. I've been there, right? I was a teenager too. So um, don't really think ahead. Don't really think about the consequences. You just do something spur of the moment. And um, it's interesting that that's when we teach you how to drive. So as long as you understand that, your brain hasn't quite got there yet, right? Some adults don't consider consequences, but physiolog physiolo physiologically, physiologically, whatever that word is, um, your brain just does it can't do it yet. It can't do it yet. So uh, important to know just because you're driving and just think you're going to take quick, um, make quick decisions without really thinking it through. And that's normal. It is normal. You just have to control it, be safe until you're an adult. And I'm gonna have to look up that word, how to pronounce physiological. Um, haven't said that one in a while, I guess. Which airline would you choose for a fun vacation? One that crashes 10% of the time, one that crashes 39%, 59%, or one that never crashes? What chance of dying is worth the risk to you? 48% of teen deaths are accidental. It's like, whoops, almost half of the deaths of teenagers is an accident. 13% caused by murder, 11% are suicide, 6% are caused by cancer, 3% heart disease. Um, big graph that shows more detail on that stuff, what this really means, motor vehicle traffic, accident. So when they say accident, which is a word that I hate, um, it's talking about 73% 73, 73 of the unintentional injuries are car crashes. So, um, yeah, half of them are accidents, whatever that is. Falling off a ladder, snowboarding into a tree. But of that category, three-fourths of them, the majority of them are car crashes. 
car crashes. So out of all the accidental teen deaths, 73% 73, 73 were caused by car crashes. Um, I don't like the word accident because I, I believe this. There is no such thing as an accident. All accidents, crashes, are caused by human choices. Every one. So every one. I, I, if a meteor strikes the planet Earth and you happen to be driving down that road and it hits you, I still would expect you to hear it, see it, avoid it, right? So that's just me. Um, I mean, that's about the best example. That's almost an accident to me. Um, but crashes are crashes. Um, something caused it. So um, risky behavior along with inexperience and immaturity causes car crashes, right? And that doesn't have to be teenagers. It can be anybody of any age. Just remember that. Risky behavior, inexperience, immaturity all together will cause car crashes. So, stats. Uh, a couple years ago, 2016, one in five crashes caused by a distracted driver. Teens are almost three times more likely to be in a crash, and that doesn't change year to year. You versus me, you have a three times greater chance to get in a crash driving than I do. Uh, there were 25,328 crashes in Idaho. 253 people died. 65% of car crashes happen in the city, but 78% of the fatalities happen in the country. So think about why that is. 83% of uh, drivers wore a seatbelt, but only 35% of those killed were wearing a seatbelt. That's evidence enough for me to wear a seatbelt. So um, most people killed in a car crash were not wearing a seatbelt. Those who were survive, typically. There a, was a crash every 21 minutes in Idaho. There's a fatal crash every 35 hours. Car crashes that involve a teen driver cause the death of 19 drivers, 19 passengers, and seven others in vehicles. So those are the car crashes um, caused by teens in 2016. The number one cause of single vehicle crashes is a rollover. So we'll talk about rollovers in a later um, later unit. It, since that's the number one cause of crashes of a car by itself, uh, we need to figure out why that is and avoid rollovers. Um, parking. So, here's some examples of bad parking. I would agree with all of those. Um, types of parking. There's perpendicular, which is straight. Um, angled, which is like a 45 degree angle. And parallel parking, which everybody hears about. It's not as bad as you think. So, um, parallel parking. If it stresses you out to stop in the middle of traffic, downtown Boise, it's 5 o'clock. Don't do it. Just drive around the block and find another place. It's not worth it. It's don't stress yourself out, right? However, um, it's a fairly easy skill. Let's take a look at it. Make sure we are all the turned 60 up. second driver. The object of parallel parking is to get yourself parallel with the curb and within 45 centimeters of it. First, check your mirrors. Then, indicate your intentions to other drivers by tapping your brakes and signaling. Pull up beside the vehicle ahead of the space. Position yourself so the rear bumpers of both vehicles are even. When it's safe, start backing up. As you reverse, steer sharply to the right. Stop when your steering wheel is in line with the bumper of the vehicle ahead. Then straighten the wheels and back into the space. Stop when the right end of your front bumper is just past the rear bumper of the vehicle ahead. Turn the steering wheel sharply to the left as you continue to reverse. Then stop and shift into drive. As you turn your wheels to the right, drive slowly forward to center your vehicle in the spot. When exiting the spot, don't forget to signal and check the traffic. For more driving tips, watch the 60 Second Driver Thursdays at 6 on CTV News. Brought to you by Manitoba Public Insurance. All right, so that's a great one. Uh, the steps are really simple, They're really, and and you may um, not practice this in driver's ed. It's not on the state test. It's not um, it's not in the skills test that you do, and so there's a good chance that you won't even practice this in driver's ed. But um, you want to practice this when you are, um, you know, you need some ideas of things to go do with your with your um, parent when you're doing your um, six months of supervised driving, that would be a good thing to go practice. I, I used to set up trash cans on my street and practice with my kids uh, between the trash cans. You can't hurt the trash can and you just practice until you're comfortable with it. So not that big of a deal. Perpendicular parking. Um, basically, uh, you swing wide, pull in wide, enter the spot slowly. You, the goal is to end up in the spot um, evenly spaced between the two vehicles 
We're in a parking lot today where you perpendicular park. Notice these lines are horizontal with one another. I'm standing at a line that my driver is going to use to start beginning to steer the car, not into that spot, but into the spot that I'm focusing in on right now. And as we look back down the parking lot, we have him there and he's beginning to move down the parking lot. He moves his car away from the actual lane that he should be driving in. There's no oncoming traffic. He has a signal light onto the right. So that's that step I mentioned, um, swing wide. So because this isn't an angled spot, he's got he's to gotta swing wide and turn so that his car ends up um, parallel to those yellow lines in the lane. And uh, as he gets to this line, he begins to steer into the actual spot. Now notice how he's swinging wide here. Um, also, so he swung wide kind of to the to the left side. I would call it like lane position two, right? Um, to the left side of the lane, which gives him room to swing wide. This part gets a little bit um, nerve wracking because you feel like you're gonna get fairly close to the car if there was a car here, um, because your car gets pretty close to it right here. You're probably really a few feet away, but it does feel like you're getting close here because if you don't swing wide, you're gonna end up too close to this other yellow line. And it's a real quick maneuver where you have to be quick with your hands. And as he moves forward into the spot, he has got himself in perfect position where the car is not over the line of the actual uh, parking stall. And he's perfectly centered in the middle of the spot. So that was done uh, to perfection. It was not done in a hurry, and that's how you want to approach every parking opportunity that you're presented with. So I like how he's like two and a half feet um, from both lines, and his front bumper is maybe a foot from the front line. So it is a perfect, it's a great job. Um, I personally think parking spaces are too small. They make me nervous. People just throw open their doors, and you'll end up with door dings. Uh, so if you have a car that you care about, try to park someplace else away from cars but in crowded areas school parking lots for example you might end up uh, having no choice and so uh, you'll want to park as much in the middle of that parking space as possible all right angled parking um, this is pretty easy um, it's it's um, really you just signal yes you should signal always anytime you're changing um, position or making a decision you should signal turn into the space um, you do have to swing a little bit wide, but it's a lot easier to slide into a uh, angled parking space um, because it's angled. Approach the spot where you want to park while getting as close to the left as possible and put your flasher to the right. In every situation where you want to park to the right entering from the front, you should do this if you have enough room to do so. By doing it, you're distancing yourself from the vehicles on the right. Therefore, you'll be able to position your vehicle as straight as possible before entering, which will make the whole maneuver a lot easier. That's why sometimes you see large vehicles like trucks or buses doing this when turning right in tight spots. By getting as much distance as possible between them and the turn, they're able to enter their lane with the vehicle in a straighter position. So the same principle applies here. Now align your right mirror a bit before the line, so more or less with the left rear light of the car on your right. For a longer vehicle, align it a bit before the light, and for a smaller vehicle, align it a bit after. Now do your verifications, central mirror, right side mirror and blind spot to the right, and if it's safe to go, turn your steering wheel completely to the right. And perhaps the blind spot check was um, for pedestrians and bike right, bicyclists who could be flying legally flying down that road and uh, you'll have to uh, yield. While moving slowly. When your car is more or less aligned with the cars on your sides, turn the wheel one and a half turn to the left to straighten the wheels and keep on moving slowly until you fit in the spot. You can check out my other videos on. All right, so that's pretty simple to, uh, to do. Uh, and you'll practice all of those in the driver's ed car for sure, all right? All right, so we are going to take a look at um, backing. Should you back into a parking spot? What do you think? Well, your instructor might have you practice that as well. But the nice thing about backing into a spot is you don't have to back out. Uh, there's no pedestrians or bicyclists behind the car. So backing in might um, take an extra, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds to do it. But when you pull out, all you do is signal 
and pull out and you can see everything in the parking space. So turnabouts. Turnabouts are a term used for U-turns, three-point turns, and two-point turns. Um, so U-turns, uh, when you need to turn completely around and go back in the same direction and the opposite direction, um, if the law allows, um, it is a way to turn your car 180 degrees and go the opposite way. So it, basically in Idaho, you can do U-turns anywhere unless there's a sign that says no U-turn, right? Um, and the, there might be some uh, some exceptions. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't want to do it at an intersection that's crazy busy. Um, so they usually put a sign that say that say, that will say U turns allowed, right? So um, it's something that can be dangerous if you are um, not prepared for it, not aware of it. The 60 second driver. If your destination is on the other side of the street or you made a wrong turn, a U-turn can help get you going in the right direction. Before making a U-turn, assess the situation to ensure it's legal and safe. A U-turn is illegal at the top of a hill, a curb in the road, if you interfere with other traffic, or if there's a sign that prohibits it. Before turning, look both ways and yield to pedestrians and oncoming traffic. You can make a U-turn at a traffic light, provided there is no sign saying otherwise. Some intersections have special U-turn lights. This indicates that you can make the turn when safe. If you have entered an intersection when the traffic light changes, complete your turn when oncoming traffic has cleared and it's safe. Instead of making a U-turn, you can also go around the block to change directions. For more driving tips, watch the 60 Second Driver Thursdays at 6 on CTV News. So I use those 60 second drivers a lot and I, I've worked with those ladies um, who make those. Um, I love them because they're 60 seconds long and they have, have videos on just about everything. So you'll see a lot of those in, in this class. Um, uh, but they're made in Canada. So sometimes the, the signs or the laws are slightly different there. Um, so two point turn, this is when uh, you're, there's not enough room for a U-turn but you have to flip around and go the opposite direction. So. Uh, in this case, the example is back into a, um, a parking space. So you notice that that blue car up here, he's backing up. These white lines are his front tires. So he's backing. So two point turn, it's one back to go forward. So literally he can just, by doing this, you know, there's just not enough room for a U-turn in this tight spot. So he can just one back up to go forward. So, and that's a two point turn. All right. I'm going to skip that video if you want to watch that. That's available in the other um, in the other um, presentation. Um, but it's so simple. I don't think I need to show that one. Three point turn is the one I will show you when there's not enough to do it, not enough room to do a U turn, and there's no driveway or parking space to back into. Then what do you do? Um, so step one here is you go across traffic and stop. Now let me pause for a second. You are in oncoming traffic at this moment. So you have to make sure there is no traffic coming in the other lane at all or in your lane because step two is then to back up, back into um, your lane again and then step three is to continue. So it's one, two, three. It's a three point turn. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about how to do a three-point turn. The three-point turn is another slow speed maneuver that you will be required to demonstrate for the purposes of a road test. So what we're going to do today, we're going to hook up the cameras, we're going to go out, we're going to do a three-point turn and show you step-by-step step how to do a three-point turn for the purposes of your road test. Stick around. We'll be right back with that information. over to the right side of the road, ensure that you check your mirrors, do a shoulder check and signal to the right. You're going to stop on the side of the road, you're going to do a mirror signal shoulder check, you're going to put your left signal on. Most of the time they're going to get you to do this on a dead end street or a limited access street. Uh, if they do get you to do it on a street where there's traffic in two directions, you're going to have to make sure that there isn't any traffic coming from either direction when you move out to the left. So you get your left signal on, you steer all the way to the left. Once you get near the center line, straighten the wheels out, drive all the way to the curb on the other side. When you get to the curb on the other side, put your right signal on, put the vehicle in reverse, do a 360 scan, so scan that there isn't any traffic coming from either direction. 
start to back up when the vehicle starts to move steer all the way to the right and look over your right shoulder as you get to the center line straighten the wheels out and then look over your left shoulder because the left side of the vehicle because the vehicle is on an angle it's going to be the left wheel at the at the rear of the vehicle the driver's rear wheel that's going to reach the curb first so you want to look over your left shoulder that way you know where to stop near the curb when you get near the curb put your left signal on do a 360 scan, signal to the left, look in the direction you want to go, steer the vehicle, and accelerate into your intended path of travel. So that, And that's all I need to show you there. Um, Three-point turn. So it is one, two, three. One is turning to up to the curb. Two is backing up to the curb. Three is continuing in the opposite direction. So that is all for the unit one, sorry, unit two presentation. Um, if you want to go back and watch that other video or take notes, you can rewatch this or go or go view the other presentation without my audio commentary. Otherwise, you can just move ahead. Remember that um, questions on the unit two quiz will come from this video as well as the other uh, reading in the unit.